we had to catch up. We were at 95, and now we're at 96. Soaring over the forests of Perianthony, living Spelljammer, our heroes have just returned from the Grove of Benthazel, now another piece of the dreaded flesh of Kur in their possession. Along the way, they received a mysterious phone call, and now as they approach the capital city of Fluris once again, and the delights and luxuries that await them, solace from all the horrors that they have beheld, it is time for our heroes to decide their next course of action. Welcome to Coriander Society Adventures, episode 96. Our heroes are currently in the world of Pyre Space. John and Asena, is there anything else that you wanted to do before you arrived in the city? No. No, nah, considering our converse... Oh, go ahead. I was just poking you. I was prompting you. Don't worry about it. Uh, no, considering that we just had a very interesting conversation with a high-ranking member of John's ex-organization, uh, he's kind of not... Reeling isn't the right word. He's extremely excited by the chance to be able to uh, both explain his actions and is really hoping at the chance to be able to rejoin the organization that is all he knew for a long, long time. True. In that case, the journey back is swift and relatively uneventful. Princess Adthea, uncharacteristically quiet. Her familiar oh. quile on her shoulder. Similarly. Upon your return, I'm going to have each of you roll a deception check for me. Sort of a, Why? A, don't, uh, don't worry about it. Oh, I see. I see. Yes. Oink, oink. Nothing happened. Hey, I didn't do so bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> Yes. 23. Okay. You managed to slip back in without immediately being discovered. And there are no immediate consequences. Adthea and Mireth are... Adthea is not eager to discuss what just happened. She wants to make her way back to her room for some quiet time to just think about what's gone on in the wide world. The two of you... It's about midday at this... Well, you had a long day. It's probably evening again. The two of you have the entire city to yourselves. If you want, you can just go straight to bed and take a long rest. Yeah, John's going to look into just checking in on those special orders he made, but I'm assuming since it's only been less than a day, not much has been... Uh, not much progress has been made. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't get a chance to stop by uh, Ithro Kassane's, uh Vale on the way back, so John makes a mental note to attempt to parlay with them at another time. All right. Perhaps even send an envoy. Yeah, John's going to go ahead and uh, set up before we go to bed. He'll set up someone in the city that he can trust, someone that's both powerful and respectable. That way, Ithro Kassane will realize if they eat them, they're going to be insulting and risking a confrontation with the King of Floris. And afterwards, John's going to send a message to Ithro Kassane with his intentions. He'll send multiple messages if necessary, but the crux of it is going to be that he is going to be bartering. John's going to be exchanging a certain amount of material wealth and or items that Ithro Kassane would not normally have in their possession in order to attain some of their scales, in order to make the belt for Asena if she so chooses. John's going to be giving on loan a number of items from his bag of holding in order to see if those will appease the dragon of Perianth, and if not, uh, he'll send along some money to take care of it instead. Are you casting a sending spell to Irtho Kassane? Yes, uh, several if necessary. Okay. You get a response from Irtho Kassane. John Carmichael. Much time has passed. Last time, you brought delightful trinkets and devices. Do you have any more of those red sticks of destruction? Oh, God. He's definitely talking about the glow sticks. Yes, he's definitely talking about the glow sticks. Um, mate, John has a lot of dynamite on him right now. 
Mm -hmm. uh, how much dynamite do you think it would take in order to... John's a pretty savvy guy, and considering he's met with Thurkasane in the past, how much dynamite do you think would be worth getting the scales required for this magic item that he wants to have crafted for Asena? What was the price of a stick of dynamite? I'm Googling now. What was the price of a stick of dynamite in the 1930s? <laughs> it's like chewing gum. It's just like, no, it's not chewing gum. We don't want chewing gum. We want, we want good price. Oh, it's we want expensive not like price. chewing gum. Yeah, it's like, it's like gold chewing gum. All right. Uh, for organizations that blast regularly, a couple of dollars. So one stick of dynamite is one Commonwealth dollar. So now we have to calculate how much, how much does a stick of dynamite weigh? There you go. Now you're thinking about portals. Mm -hmm. 190 grams. 190 grams to freedom units. <laughs> All right. So Tree one, city. One stick of dynamite is about 0.4 pounds. How many pounds okay. of actually? Yeah. So. So I'm carrying 500 pounds of dynamite, which is basically a little over 2,000 Commonwealth bucks. That seems that seems odd that I could go buy a two a, a dollar would get me you no know, two dollars would get me two things of dynamite two point two things of dynamite no two point one things of dynamite. So I thought it was a dollar for a dynamite. Half a dollar for point four. Per well, dynamite. a dollar per, a dollar per, per dynamite. Oh, hold on, I'm working the math. Okay, so 500 pounds divided by 0. 0.41 means you've got roughly 1,194 sticks of dynamite, which means that that's about 1,200 dollars of dynamite. Wow, that's not very much. Are you sure you're doing your math right? You said that a stick of dynamite yeah. was a 0. 0.4 of a pound. Right. Which means that with 500 pounds of dynamite, that would at least be twice that amount of dynamite. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I those. see. I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get it. I'll gotcha. post it in chat. I'll post it. Oh, no, it, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I get it. Why um, are we doing math? Because he wants to sell dynamite to the dragon in exchange for its scales to make you something well, cool. Well, I'm hoping to exchange what it wants rather than having to pay for, like, you know, actual value. If it, if here's, dynamite, here's dynamite is a dollar in, in Northport. I don't think dynamite's a exactly. dollar here on Perianth. Also, yeah. like you're the, who else is gonna sell this dragon dynamite? That exactly. means you can ask for a premium. Mm -hmm. And the, the dollar's just the baseline. Exactly. Lena has exactly. her visor out and her cat, like her little <laughs> running the math, running the numbers. Exactly my point. So, again, I ask you, mate, how, how much dynamite should John <laughs> offer this dragon to get what he needs? Well, I need to figure out how many scales you need. Oh god. I feel like a, we had a whole conversation about this. A plot appropriate <laughs> amount of scales in order to get this belt. <laughs> um All right. Let's let's do this, Matt. Add dynamite to scales math to the to-do list. And Copy that. your dynamite is currently on consignment. So until we've run the math, you do not have access to your dynamite. <laughs> Oh, you'd love that, wouldn't you? But after we've run the math, when we determine how much dynamite you should still have left, so we're not doing math on stream, you can have all the dynamite that remains back. That's the only way I can think of to do this fair. So, uh, for the belt we're looking for, it would be a very rare dragon hide belt. Mm -hmm. Which, I, I don't know how much you're judging very rare item in terms of money. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we can do exactly... We'll take care of it off stream, how much yeah. that's going to be. Perfect. Just add that to the to-do list. Dynamite on consignment. We'll run the math. We'll figure, and then we'll say, like at the beginning of the the stream, your assistant will run up and say, "Excuse me, sir. We have this many pounds of dynamite for you in accordance with local law and the the trade agreement that you enacted with the dragon." Perfect. I'm all about it. Great. Hey, John. Send send the send the dragon this too. And is you see a Santa like hand over a piece of paper, and it's like a drawing of the golden. Paper whale. <laughs> <laughs> this can be yours for the low price of give me back my dynamite. And it says like it says like extremely rare gold. Oh my god. Okay, so hold on. I, I see I see <laughs> this is like one of those gotcha moments where we have like three different tiers. There's 
Hey, dragon, if you want bronze tier, I've got some money for you. If you want silver tier, here's a bunch of dynamite. But the gold tier, we have this golden whale. What does it do? Take it and find out. Asana's out here selling golden whale NFTs. <laughs> oh, no, it's not an NFT. This is the promise of an actual deliverable artifact. <laughs> but also, if it's you just want fungible. the picture, we'll pay for it, and no one else has it but you, except for everyone else we make one for. In which case, you know, you have this one. And you it's should be actually not me. fungible because there's only one of them. That's <laughs> true. Wait, no. <laughs> uh, John takes John downloads. He scans it, downloads it, and now he makes a million of them on his crazy dual disc that just start appearing everywhere. Oh, he assigns them VIN numbers. Fungible. <laughs> We've now made uh, NFTs, and then John immediately kills them all. <laughs> Crashes though. Screw the blockchain. We have real money, and we don't have time for ether currency. Oh my god, maybe we should make ether currency. You guys should be. I do a blockchain on the Ethernet. That but like crazy. ethereal currency. Oh my god! Like actual ethereal. Ethereal. <laughs> I will say on cat on the in person game that we did, Janessa, uh, there was yeah. a crypto currency undead. Oh. Oh my That's god. Good. Okay. Nonetheless, working through intermediaries, John contacts the green dragon Irthokasin, who rules over an enchanted veil not too far away from Benthazel's grove, adjacent to Benthazel's former territory and makes a deal exchanging dynamite, which he once used to blow up Zuniel's, like, second-in-command violently, because, you know, how else are you going to blow someone up? Uh, the dragon saw a demonstration of his that and was like, you know, got any more of that trinitrotoluene? Anyways, you, that deal you remember is... remember when we were super huge on Thermite? Like, remember Thermite was, like, the thing? Everyone in high school is like, oh, Thermite, Thermite. Yeah. So... Aside from consigning out your dynamite for dragon scales to make that cool, awesome item for Asena, and at they are running off to just go ahead and cope, is there anything else that a lot of you have to do today? Uh, John's going to send along one wooden spoon along with all of this. I hope you're keeping inventory on where all the spoons are. Nope, I just have how many are left. That's your job. <laughs> all right, good enough. Good enough. <clears throat> I, you know, eventually when I've lost like 20 of them, I'm just going to say, oh yeah, that person has a spoon. And what are you going to do to stop me? Go back through all the episodes? I don't no, think so. No, that is not a thing I'm going to do. <laughs> Somewhere in the fan wiki, years down the line, there will be an exact accounting of all the spoons, including spoon duplicates and like plot holes in the spoon At territory. At that point, that have been... I will be a damn liar. <laughs> <laughs> For every spoon you have lied about, I will deduct one experience point. <sighs> It'll start to make up for all the times I muted myself. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Sun sets upon the beautiful elven city of Fluris. What else will our heroes do? If we can check in with Benthazel, I, I'd like to do that. But honestly, I feel like she's just going to be with healers for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, druids primarily. Druids with restorative magic. Cool, like healing waters, sacred springs, that kind of thing. I would. Oh, sorry, I do remember. Sorry, go, go ahead, finish what you were saying. I'm done. John has to sneak into the place, so he's going to be going. He has the flesh of core. There's no reason why he wouldn't go back to the vault with us, uh, with King and Dogalad, and he's going to have to do what Athia suggested and plant a camera there in order to make sure that we can find out about it. John's going to plant a camera somewhere inconspicuous, and more importantly, he needs to take something. She asked him to take something from the vault. Okay. So you go to King Indogalad's throne room and ask him to keep safe this piece of the flesh? Well, I figure as soon as they get back, he's probably going to meet with John, considering last mm -hmm. time when John gave both the pieces that he had, the plan was to have him bring it back because he did this really cool water sealer where it was able they can study the flesh of core and also keep it hidden from elder sight true 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 okay the king meets you once again and if he noticed that his daughter was out on this adventure he didn't say anything about it what daughter <laughs> he looks concerned for a moment as if afraid that his own mind has emptied out of that precious memory and shakes his head the moment has passed and beckons you 
into the very heart of the tree through secret passages where at his command the bark and living wood of the enormous trunk of the tree parts leading to secret spirals and catacombs within the wood there its lifeblood the sticky sap of this enormous living being awaits as a trap to ensnare any who do not belong there but in the company of the elven king you descend all the way down to the deep roots there you come to a, an end a hollow illuminated by fairy lights and once again at the king's beckoning the roots that form a cavern spread apart revealing the inner hidden vault of king and dogalod and his forbidden knowledge you've been here once before but you didn't go inside you just stood outside while he went in this time he takes i assume that you're encapsulating the piece of flesh in water again ah uh, yes john's going to give over the piece of flesh via mage hand to and dogalod to also re presumably receive the uh uh telekinetic means and while Indongalon is using the ritual in order to seal the flesh of gore john is going to innocuously as possible if a is with him he's going to have a uh by a previous request make not a large but slight distraction just keeping Indongalon just busy enough in order for him to take something and plant something Um, I don't know. Do I have to distract him? <laughs> John did make such a request of you. I know that part. Just a slight distraction. Um, you don't need to like trip and fall or anything, but while he's busy sealing up, he'll be mostly focused. So if you could just have idle chatter with him, kind of maybe stand in such a way where you're going to be blocking line of sight to me for the most part, that would be help enough. Nothing big. I'm just going to stare at him. I see. Awkwardly exactly. stare at him, drawing his attention towards you. Very good. Yeah. I mean, and if he doesn't notice anything, then I, all I have to do is stand there. But right. if he does notice, then he's going to be like, why are you staring at me? And his attention, we focus entirely on you. Yeah. Perfect plan. I love it. We flash back. Hey. Sorry, what? I said, thanks. With this perfect plan in place, we flash back to the deep vaults, which has an outer and inner chamber. Two sets of doors. The outer door is what you've seen open before. The inner door, you've never seen the inside of, because it's almost like an airlock, where he closes the outer and then opens the inner. So, he steps into the in-between chamber, bearing the flesh of Kur. And his back is turned to you, Asena as he prepares to shut the door behind him. John, his back is also turned to you. He's facing the inner door. Perfect. The outer door is about to close. But, I mean, he allowed us in last time. Is he allowing us in this time? Um, you didn't ask to go in last time. Last time, I remember the way that the interaction went down. He just kind of went inside and dropped it off. No, I was there, right? I was right there with him, standing next to him as he took care of it. Mm -hmm. All right. Then the two so is he aren't... is he keeping us from coming this time? Because nope. but he's not okay. inviting you either. So John John is going to go with him again, not changing tempo from last time. We'll mm -hmm. walk side by side, and unless he says otherwise, he's going to walk with them within the vault and then change off and offer the flesh of core once they're safely inside. Got it. With the outer door sealed and the inner door still shut, he takes possession, floating it in his hand in a sphere of water, without touching any of it. And while he's busy, John is just going to nonchalantly uh, move away from 
Dergalan putting Asena between himself and the king is his, I'm assuming, back to John at this time. Mm-hmm. All right. John utilizing both his magic and technology. He's going to avoid actually doing any kind of field of magic in order to not mm-hmm. arouse the senses of Ndogla, but since he already summoned his mage hand to pass off the flesh of Kor, not canceling the casting of the spell, he's going to take one of his cameras, one of his spy cameras out from his pack, and he's going to find a position here within the, the vault where he'd be able to set up such a small innocuous piece of technology in a location that seems to be gives him enough space to be able to make and see what's happening, but additionally not be out in the open. Something he can hide. Okay. The door to the inner vault opens. The chamber within is scarcely illuminated by blue lights that seem to dangle from the ceiling like root tendrils. Inside, you can see row after row of bookshelves covered with scrolls, mostly scrolls, rather than full-on fledged books. There are pods. Not of war. Probably. Yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> pods of, of or vegetable matter that conceal various objects. A pool of burbling something that smells not foul, but it sort of stings your nose. He steps in carefully, and you can see that these vaults down here in the roots of the tree, it's not one big chamber. It's a whole bunch of confusing, winding, organic-seeming tunnels. Give me a perception check to spy out and see if there's a good place you can pop the camera. All right. Perception. 28. 28. Given all the nooks and crannies here, there's absolutely places where you could pop it, probably on the ceiling, and it would be attached and have decent visibility. Actually, with a 28, excellent visibility. And more importantly, not discoverable. Somewhere yes. where it can be Concealed. nicely tucked in. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Now roll sleight of hand to launch it quietly. And again, I want to, before I roll this, I want to clarify, aside from this mage hand, John is not using magic to disguise himself, but he is activating his dual disc in mm-hmm. order to make some sort of hard light. Uh, again, he's not making like a big, like, like he normally makes this big, like almost mosaic, perfectly reflecting what I would see of John mm-hmm. to try to hide him. He's just kind of obscuring himself ever so subtly, making himself look a little bit hazy to where mm-hmm. uh, peripherally it almost makes you invisible if you're not looking directly at them. All right. 21. 21. You swiftly slip in under the cover of this hologram that you're projecting and install the camera. It clicks on, doesn't even make that noise, silently adheres itself. Asena, you are staring at Indogalad just according to plan, yeah. but you're staring at the back of his head because he's walking into the vault to put the flesh of Kur somewhere. Yeah. As you continue to stare, he moves around a bookshelf and out of sight for a moment. Mate, did he already seal the flesh of Kur away? He put it in the bubble of water, and now he's sealing it inside one of those plant pods. Okay. We are in the location that Adthea told us, right? We're in the vault, and this is where she asked me to be? hmm Okay, good. Just making sure. Yep. You have a couple of moments as he finishes sealing it inside of this container, and then he's going to round the corner again and come back into view. John She's still just was... standing there staring at him. Perfect. It's going according to plan. Adthea had told John to take something while down here. Mate, mm-hmm. what was it that she wanted him to take? I'm assuming it wasn't just anything, like any old thing. There was a particular sort of. It was object. any old thing because it's a uh, it's a sympathetic object for scrying, teleportation, defeating. Oh, she okay. She also it's wanted you scrying. to. Okay. She also wanted you to analyze any magical defenses on the place. Okay. Well, while we were making our way in, I'm assuming John would be looking around, and while he's planting it, anytime he can, John's going to do that. But first, he'll take something before 
being in Indogalot's sight, and then as they're mm -hmm. here and leaving, finishes analysis. Okay. There are scrolls nearby, as well as some wands. Not magical, just used for arcane focus. Uh, orbs, also arcane foci. And a clay pot with a wax seal on it. Which of those four things would you want to grab? They're all relatively easy to grab. Can John activate his wizard sight to try to focus in on Indogalod's like register, his arcane register, in order to try to find something that would be most sympathetic to the king? As you activate your wizard sight, the entire vault suddenly flares up in brilliant blue like you're looking into the heart of a melted down nuclear reactor oh my yes roll an intelligence saving throw please lovely intelligence saving throw you say i'm gonna roll this and then in, don't tell me if it's good bad or otherwise i'm gonna okay good an 18 john is going to roll a deduction die on that 23 total 23 total okay the defense here is to shut your eyes before it burns out your wizard sight probably temporarily oh. probably temporarily but okay. you know uh you quickly realize this is part of this place's defensive mechanisms good good it's saturated with painful arcane energy that it doesn't affect the skin but it affects the arcane senses would John, have, would he have had any time to notice anything? Or is this a, you made the save, which means you immediately shut your eyes? Roll an Arcana check. I'm going to use one of my lucky die. I'm going to try that one more time. Okay. John is going to use another deduction die. And... That would be a dirty 20. And if it was a failure, I have one more thing if you need me to. With a dirty 20, you can tell that the majority of the things that resonate with Indogalod are deeper inside. Um, however, all of these things in here have been in the Fluris family for a long time, a few generations, which in elven terms is a long time. Yeah. There is one other thing that you recognize as you're scanning around. The clay pot with the wax seal has a symbol, not very well inscribed, pretty roughly inscribed on the top of it. it it's a, a series of lines, almost like an upside down pitchfork. That, I recognize that, don't I? That is the sign of the Pact Malefic. That's what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. How does it have dust on it? Does, is there... Yeah, it has dust. It probably hasn't it's been, been here for some while. time. Mm -hmm, looks forgotten. Well, that one, I suppose. Okay. You quickly swipe that as Indogalod rounds a corner. Well done. With John's background, mate, mm -hmm. would it make sense for him to... Seeing as he is a, a detective and uh, someone who's used to being within a crime scene... Would it make more or less sense for John to take the item and put something else in its place as if to maybe suggest to someone that maybe they picked it up by mistake and put something else here and it may have just been misplaced or would it be better just to leave it alone? You can pick insight or investigation. In this case, I'm going to use investigation. A 23. It was out of the way in a corner under a few other things it, oh okay it's not likely to be noticed perfect didn't realize it was i thought it was in the open so that's yeah that's perfect i'll leave it alone okay king and dogalod is about to walk to exit the vault back into the antechamber between the two doors that seal off to protect this place and he's treating this all business-like somewhat solemnly without saying anything to you and is waiting for you to be out of the way so that he can shut the inner door. 
John is just kind of lingering a bit. He's getting one last look around, trying to test for the magical defenses. At this point, the only test he was really able to do was the wizard sight. Uh, I would assume that he's just kind of moving around, and he, he's making it seem as though he's just kind of browsing. Um, mm -hmm. Not so much as this is like a magic shop where like, ooh, I would like this, or I would like this. It's more so like, wow. And and he's honestly like not, not, even, not even making a, a show of it. He's genuinely impressed by mm -hmm. the collection of the Court of Fleurus uh, and all of this magical wealth and riches that were able to be accumulated over several generations of elven lifetimes. There must be an entire... And within this vault, you can only imagine the knowledge and power held within here and the secrets as well. And he's hoping that in the few moments that he has, he, he's not going to be able to unlock the secrets of this place, but can at least get a sense of what, aside from the burning away of wizard sight, that this place would have by prolonging your stay here. Well, given your previous Arcana check, it's safe to say that this is protected by a private sanctum spell, which is almost universal for all powerful wizards with secrets to hide. Uh, blocks divination, blocks teleportation, prevents people from seeing in from the outside. Uh, you can look it up, Mordenkainen's private sanctum. Like I said, nearly standard. So you're definitely able to glean that much. Okay, private sanctum and burning of wizard sight. Anything else I could try to dress her and ascertain, or is that about it for now? Not when he's about to close it, but you do know that the door only opens for him. And he does some sort of gesture to it, but it's likely also coded to the bloodline. Very good. That's as much as I can do for now. All right. He will go ahead and shut the door behind him. And as you walk up through the secret passages again, he holds aloft just a little bit of a simple light spell to guide the way. He may have dark vision, but you know you see better with a little bit of light anyways. Absolutely. He's very non-talkative until you emerge back into the back areas of the tree before passing through some curtains back into the more public areas. Does it seem as though, with again, with John's sense of people, is he specifically trying to avoid speech while he's here, or does he just seem slightly unnerved or distracted? Distracted. Not unnerved, but definitely distracted. He fiddles a silver ring set with tiny emeralds on his hand as he makes the way his way up. He fits like they weren't there previously, but now he just put them on. No, he's he's he wears it like all the time, but he's fiddling with it right now. So he's we'll fiddling with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, as he fiddles with his rings before turning off his mage hand, John's just going to use the mage hand to kind of put a hand on Endogla's shoulder, give him a little squeeze, and if he turns towards him, he's just going to kind of nod and smile at the king. It's a delayed reaction, but with a very small. I'm royalty, and I don't do big emotions most of the time. He returns the uh, gesture appreciatively. And then he is eager to hear tell of fair Benthazel and the trials she f faced and how you found her. You can either montage this or roleplay this, your choice. Well, fair king, uh, he was not in a very good way, as would be obviously apparent. She went slightly mad, maybe more than slightly. The effect of the flesh of gore must have been a obviously powerful thing indeed. Not only was her mind addled with woe, worry, and madness, but physically she was, is, in a dreadful state. Scars and splinters across her body, her flesh cracks, and she appears beyond tired. I can only imagine what she's had to endure these many years, and I'm exceedingly grateful that we were able to finally bring it to an end. I'm only hopeful that, with your majesty's assistance, she can return to a semblance of, of what she was and put the experience behind her. We've undone the harm of a twisted tree once before, John Carmichael. I am certain we shall do so once again. Twice before. This should be the third time, right? Coralis, then John, and now Benthazel. I cannot say we helped Coralis. 
Well, I mean, technically, I helped Coralis by, you know, taking on the burden. Ah, uh, but... We would do more than that. We plucked it from you with the spark of a god and bequeathed it upon none. Still, it remains bound and harmless. My king, there is no way to destroy such a thing. It must remain hidden and sealed. It will remain hidden and sealed until we understand it. And with understanding, a thing can be destroyed. Does John feel that the king is sincere in what they are saying? Or could they possibly be holding on to a reactionary super weapon? <laughs> uh, give me insight. I do what you ask, and, and we've Asana, got you're a... there as well. Give me an insight roll. Yeah. Dirty twenty. Okay. Dirty twenty. Also, mate, was that a? You said it was a jar, a sealed jar with an upside down a mark clay of... jar with a wax seal and the sign of the Pact Malefic on it. Very dusty. Thank you. Hasn't um... been touched for a long time. Sorry. <laughs> Asena uh, is still staring at King <laughs> He's going to break one of these days. I just know it. He seems absolutely sincere. That to Asena or was that to John? Uh, to John. To Asena... He's avoiding her gaze because he doesn't want to start a staring competition because he'll lose. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just ignoring me? Mm hmm. I love you the idea that as they're walking back, his mind is burdened with the power and, uh, and responsibility of rulership. And he kind of is getting this moment before he sees all his subjects. He's fiddling with himself, kind of just taking this moment. John interrupts him from his reverie by giving him just a slight assurance, and then the entire time Asana's just staring daggers at him as they're walking through this place. In cartoon mode, it's like you just see her slide around the corner. Has anyone seen that that meme where that kid is running down the hallway and there's that person just floating? floating? Like, yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yes. In Dogalad, Asena, yes. To where will your travels take you next, friends Asena, friend John? Do you continue to seek out the flesh? Always, Your Majesty. However, we will be taking a slight detour. Um, as I mentioned to you in our previous meeting, we were able to reach out and secure a meeting with an official from my previous organization. Asana well, technically, he reached out to us, but uh, yeah. Yes, you're right. That's 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 technically. I figured we wouldn't bog him down with the minutia of it, but you're right. They reached out oh. to us. Asena, the trap is sprung. When you say that, he turns in your direction to look at you. I stare again. <laughs> oh, hypnotoad. <laughs> <laughs> John, you can continue. Should you so choose? Is Ntokola looking back at Asena, or does he turn yes, back to John? he's looking back at Asena. John just kind of awkwardly stares there for a moment as he kind of trails off in his explanation, looking between the two of them, and he recalls back to the time that when John first met Ntokola, they shared a wizard site that had them bore into each other's souls, and he can only imagine what such an experience would be like with Asena. And after a few long, drawn-out moments, John's going to continue. Uh, yes, in any case, we are meeting with uh, an official from my previous organization. We're going to neutral ground. And I can only hope that such a thing is as earnest as they've suggested, and not merely a trap with which to capture us. Uh, that being said, uh, my lord, if you wouldn't mind, uh, in about, uh, and John's going to give him a about 12 hour time frame after their meeting is supposed to take place, if you could just send me a message, and if you don't get a response, uh, I'm not certain where in the universe I will be, but I'd like you to have this. John's going to give him one of his socks. It's been washed, I assure you. Um, but if you could use this to find me, I would take it as the highest 
compliment that my services could still be of use to you if you would rescue me from whatever predicament Sana and I found ourselves in. I think I just saw a ghost. That's Matt, not John. I cannot speak to the ways of elves of other worlds you may have visited, John. But here we are free to do as we choose and need not be set loose by a gift of clothing. Did did he actually say that, Mater? Are you just trolling I'm me? I'm shit posting. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving in dog a lot of sock. Um, God, the memes, the memes. All right, he will go ahead and take the sock and agree to cast sending spell to just say, uh, "You good?" in twelve hours. And unless there's anything else that the king of the court of Loris requires, uh, John wants to take his rest, and then, as long as the Sena doesn't require anything else they're gonna i was presumably head to the meeting spot no you are you are free to go with the blessing of all flores and should you seek safe refuge for the flesh within the vaults of this tree the power of our house shall keep it safe as always you're ever too kind and generous my lord all right the two of you gain the benefits of a long rest if you haven't already Benthazel will be left here within their custody. And you have a ticket to the Panopticon, which is an interdimensional meeting place that's meant to be safe because nobody can pull tricks on anybody there because it, Panopticon means all seeing. While you've taken a yawn, mate, when we awaken from our slumber, uh, John is going to activate his trap card, triple threat. Uh, and when they awaken, John is going to put on a little show uh, for Asena and for their their charges, both Chester and Dargan. And uh, as much as necessary, uh, I'll in real life do with any any amount of singing, dancing, and or acting you need of me. Uh, but as part of his ten minute uh, preparation to embolden his allies and give them uh, his inspiring leader bonus. John is going to put on a little show, utilizing his uh, his hard light dual disc. He's going to display, uh, in, as quickly as possible, a small little three-act show uh, when One Two Punch was formed, when John uh, came to Yord and met with uh, Asena and Gaston, going on their adventures, culminating in the climax when they were able to defeat that which had been so desperately trying to take down Asena and Gaston on Yord. And now their adventures, as I lost one of their companions ever since, moving towards the Flesh of Gore in order to save all of life across the universe. So, triple threat, I'm only going to give you one of the three right now. Fine, understandable. Which one do you want to go for? Singing, acting, or dancing? Uh, let's say acting at this point. That makes the most sense, I think. Okay, roll performance check to deliver the entire story. Chester is just sitting there like, I, yes, yes, I was there. I was there the entire time. A 22. Dargan wants to know if he can eat John, Asena. What? Why? The 22? Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? Why do you want to eat John? We are not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? We have witnessed the story of your journeys. We desire to understand better. Can we eat him? Are you going to understand him by eating him? Yes. I, I, I don't know if that's how it works. Have you ever tried? <laughs> I've eaten things. And by eating, you understand them better. Maybe what they're made out of. Yes. No, you can't eat John. Fine. Is John with an earshot of this? Yes. 
Zargon, what about a slight amount of understanding? I, I can't allow you, as Asena has, has very, very rightfully supported, you can't eat all of me, but uh, would a small sampling suffice in satiating your curiosity? We do not want scraps. We are bored oh, now. Then... We will do something else. I was going to say, then you then you get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you lose. Good day, sir. Good day, sir. John summons a hard light door, slams it, and then walks. <laughs> okay, now you for that slamming the door, you get the acting from Triple Threat. Oh, good. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's all it took. All right. The ticket that you got on your phone is a QR code that's actually a teleportation circle and also something you can focus on in the astral. The panopticon can be accessed through the astral, either by casting teleportation circle once you're there or by focusing on it. One way or another, it's easy for you to get to the astral. There's a wide variety of ways that you can do that. You'll probably have to expend some sort of resource what is your plan to reach the Panopticon? We have to I mean, I... get there. It's in the astral plane. They didn't provide travel. Well, I suppose I can just cast any old teleportation spell and you can take us to the astral, Asena. We'll hop on Rocco and make our way there, as we always do when we're in that place. You know, do you do you think Rocco's necessary? Dwight, um Are you are you having a laugh? Well, I'm just saying, like I'm not saying Rocco's bad or anything. It's just like I think we can move without Rocco. I do like the safety that he provides. No, I mean you're you're technically correct. I mean we I think that there's quite a lot of security that Rocco offers us, but no, I mean, you're right, as long as uh, we don't mind having to deal with what the Astro will throw at us, then no, Rocco's not required in the slightest. So we just use Rocco as a big shield? Effectively, yes. It's a, it's a very uh, subvertive mode of transportation to ensure that we are as least harassed as possible as we make our way through that large, infinite expanse. That being said, we encountered an Empyrean and absolutely destroyed it. Uh, we fought an entire group, a pack of Mind Flayers with their Elder Brain. Uh, technically, I don't think there's much in the cosmos, aside from something that we're not expecting, that can, well, as long as we're properly prepared, I think that we can handle just about anything that life can throw at us. Oh, it's just a question. Do you want to continue exploring the expanse of the astral plane without Rocco? No. Okay, good. Well, then, are you ready to go? Yes. Then let us hold hands. And John will create a circle with chalk. He'll begin tracing the signs of his spell. Uh, he's going to put in all the grandeur that makes this seem like it's going to be an absolutely uh, impressive display. And uh, and then he's just going to cast, let's see, what's one of the lowest little spells he has prepared that can pull this off? Gosh, it's not very low level. I guess Dimension Door, this is, this is as good as he can do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, Asena, I assume that you're going to go ahead and jump out of that brief conduit that's barely formed between point A and point B and shove your way into yeah. the astral. All right. Welcome back. Are we able to, I forget, are we able to focus on, or rather, this is Asena's doing, or is she able to focus on Rocco when we head here, or is it entirely random? You're able to focus on Rocco. Rocco counts as a place that you're very familiar with. Oh, perfect. Yes, I thought so. Assuming you want to go to Rocco. We're going to Rocco. Yeah, okay. it's Rocco it is. Each of you roll 1d6, please. I think we're rolling low, is the hope. 
Well, shit. Before and? And? Uh. Hey. Three. All right. Okay. It's going to take you seven hours to make your way. I was solidly average. (laughs) (laughs) Show me seven. Yes. Okay. As you float your way through the infinite astral sea, Asena, you recall your most recent encounter within the depths of a adult dream state. Somewhere out there is Goltharius's hidden lair, his refuge. Hey, mate, I'm sorry. It's coming through kind of garbled. Can you hear me now? Yes. Do yeah. I just need to speak up? It went from being I, kind of... I think it was a network uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, ah. probably. Ah. Anyways, Asena, you... The last time that you were here in your mind, you experienced Goltharius's home, and you know that he's somewhere out here. And all you'd yeah. have to do is focus on that. <laughs> um, as... Can I focus on, like, think about... I mean, do we have, like, a physical invite to this Panopticon, or...? Mm-hmm. Well, it's digital, but it's sort of got the idea embedded in it. So if you... You haven't gotten to Rocco yet. It's going to take you seven hours to reach Rocco. Or you oh, can just right. start heading to the place already. And it counts as a place that you have studied carefully because you have a link to it. I but we technically do... don't know how long it would take, right? Correct. I want to do all of the above. All right. If you think about mul- more than one thing, you're just sort of going to... No, no, no. Like, I'm thinking about Rocco. Mm-hmm. And then, like, once I've done that for five minutes, I'm going to think about the the invite or, like, where, uh, ponder about where the Panopticon can be and see if I'm being pulled in a different direction. Perfect. Good idea. And, and then I'm going to think about Gotharius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, going to see, like, am I being pulled in different directions? They're all going the same place. Like, oh my god. Right. Okay. Oddly enough, the Panopticon feels closer. Oh. Than Rocco. Hmm. You okay. are being pulled in three completely different directions. The Panopticon feels the closest, then Rocco, and then Goltharius far at the edges of your consciousness in a completely oh, different wow. direction. Oh my god. Okay. Well, if we can ascertain that it's closer to go to the Panopticon, then yeah, I think it makes more sense to, to go there. Yeah, you just see Asena, like, stop and start, like, going one way and then going the other way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> John just kind of, like, floats. He, he, he takes out a, uh, a book and just kind of begins reading. <laughs> And it's just kind of floating there with Chester. He's just kind of idly scratching Chester as they kind of float around. What are you uh, reading about? Wouldn't you like to know, weather boy? <laughs> it's an older <laughs> meme, sir, but it checks out. No, what are you reading about? You don't uh, have to be too John, specific. John is actually trying to do research on how to create that magical nuke that he discovered in uh, Yachak's palace. Mm. He's basically trying to make sure he can collect as much data as possible. So when next they see Gaston, he's going to be able to get his assistance with the tech aspect of what is needed. Okay, roll an intelligence check. I mean, John already has a pretty good handle on tech, but Gaston has a mastery of it. Mm-hmm. Intelligence, you say. No specific uh, skill, just, just intelligence. intelligence checks. Copy that. Am I able to utilize... Uh, is it still a skill check? Do I still get to use like my deduction dice and stuff with this? Sure. All right. John is going to go ahead and use one of his lucky die in order to re-roll that. And then he's going to utilize a deduction die in order to hopefully just brush this thing. Well, Beck. Uh, that's a 24, and if it wasn't good enough, I have something else in the back pocket. John, as you start reading and thinking about it, 
you feel yourself floating in a different direction. Interesting. How far does that seem to feel? You don't have the same sensitivity to the astral that Asena does. She can tell rough distances or time distances. You don't have that innate connection. As John is just idly sitting there reading, where does he seem to be floating? Is it closer to Gotharius's position? Is it closer to the Draco's position? Completely or is it separate. From all three of them? Mm -hmm. You got to remember, the astral isn't like, you can't really 3D map the astral because it's driven by thought, yeah. ideas and concepts. Directions are almost meaningless. It's more focusing on the thing that matters. Now, wait, hold on a moment. If directions are meaningless, then why can Rocco be any closer to the Panopticon than Lothar well, is? Because I rolled to see the travel time to each of them, and uh, I randomly rolled Panopticon the lowest. And what of this one, whatever this is? You don't get that. <laughs> like, normally you don't get any of that information. Asena gets that oh. information because she's Asena. I understand. I'm just so it's so it, it it doesn't line up with any of that. It's not Correct. pulling in any of the directions she's moving. Okay. Correct. Oh, good to know. That's, Those thoughts that's are pulling you in a different direction. What direction okay. you could focus well, on, obviously. John is not focusing on that. John is reading idly and he realizes he's being pulled. He ignores it because it's not anywhere that Asena seems to be getting pulled, and he's not going to distract the okay. same. All right then. Asena, where are you leading the team? Um, how's about a shortcut? And do you see her headed towards the Panopticon place? She just switches directions and hopes they follow. Dargan is obviously following. Yeah, John's going to just continue uh, floating. He realizes that since, uh, again, movement is kind of moot here. He's not going to assume a Superman stance, which he nearly does when flying to this place. And he's just going to kind of like gently lay there, kind of spinning in place as he's just reading. Okay. And they begin soaring through the Silver Sea. Oh, you know what? Is John able to read while concentrating, mate? Not, like, hardcore in-depth. So if it's super difficult stuff, no. Okay, well, with a 24, is he able to continue <laughs> reading while yeah. doing this? Yeah. All right. It's nothing insane. John is just going to uh, consistently make sure that he has silent image up. It lasts for 10 minutes at a time, so he'll just reconcentrate when he has to. And for a 15-foot cube around them, he's going to make Rocco. Fake Rocco, got it. Yeah, he's gonna put a fake Rocco <laughs> around him. So to all of us, this is why he's not the concerned. Highlight. Yeah, <laughs> we see a, we have a fake Rocco that we all can kind of see through around us. But to everyone looking out, there's a copy of our most beautiful and famous rock. After six hours, you see a spinning pool of color in the distance. It's red almost like a velvety red. In fact, it almost has the texture of velvet, like a piece of cloth swirling instead of a pool of liquid. When you think about the Panopticon, you're being pulled in that direction. Interesting. Okay. Well, All you have I to assume- do is pass through it, it's your choice. Well, I guess we should assume position, right, Asena? Let's go through the swirly thing. Exactly it cost that. me. And John's going to take hold of Asena's hand, make sure that Chester's wrapped around his arm, and is hoping that Dragon is holding on to something of them as they pass through. Okay. The exhilarating, skin-tingling, menthol sensation of the Astral Sea vanishes. <laughs> as you pass through the color pool. I love going through these color pools. On the other side, it's bright, but not searingly bright, sort of a warm illumination everywhere. Gravity reasserts itself and you feel, you smell something 
mouth-watering, delicious. Salt and butter, and it's just wafting up. And a glance behind, the color pool is gone, replaced by a set of doors. Big old ornate doors, sort of brass along the sides, and then uh, glass in between. There's carpet beneath your feet, red but with sort of a diamond pattern to it. The light is being cast by gas lamps hanging from the walls. This chamber is beautifully made with carved wood everywhere that you go, and there's a counter in front of you. Nobody's behind it. There's a couple of red uh, velvet cue lines weaving back and forth, um, and hallways leading off to either side. Behind the counter is a machine making popcorn. An old-fashioned popcorn machine. Just The place looks utterly deserted. A popcorn machine and it is a deserted queue line? Yeah, you're, you're in a movie theater. Oh. But like an old movie theater. Like a golden old age of cinema it. movie theater. And there's no one else here. Um... You want some popcorn? Actually, yes. Yes, I would. Also, I'd like to know what the deal is here. What do you mean the deal? Well, there must like be Like a two-for-one sort of deal. On popcorn, yes. Uh, mate, there's no attendance even, right? Near the popcorn? There's, there's nobody here. Give me a perception check, both of you, please. And uh, I'm sure the perception check is going to confirm this, but when you say no one here, do you mean nobody like in this planet, like even the sights, sounds, and smells of people, creatures, and things are gone, or just in this immediate vicinity of the Megaplex? You don't see anybody. And again, Megaplex is a modern word. This is an old theater where like... Okay, fine, theater. <laughs> like, uh, think, think the Balboa Theater in downtown San Diego, except it's obviously got movie projection projections, right? So it's this old, ornate... Um, Everything seems quiet, except that they're down one of the two hallways out to the actual theaters. One of the doors is slightly open, and you can hear music coming through that door. Should we popcorn first and then investigate, or should we uh, check out the music first, Asana? Well, I think we're supposed to get popcorn. Before going to the show, you're right. Absolutely. They might think it's rude. Plus, I wouldn't mind popcorn. I'm going to go along with what you're saying. I think that we might be bordering along the uh, the edge of, of rudeness by either taking without permission. But I like your style. I think we'll leave some money on the counter, take what we need, and then we'll find out what's playing. It's their fault for not having attendance here. Ready, right? Uh, yeah, maybe they're the rude ones. I'm happy with that. Let's do it. And, uh, if Asena hasn't already made their way towards the popcorn, John is going to either follow them or, uh, begin walking in that direction. Okay. There's, all the implements are there, the butter that you can pour all over it, salt, uh, none of the modern seasonings. Again, it's very old-fashioned, all things considered. Asena, you yes. notice Dargan slinking along the floor like a snake behind the counter. Dargan? Do you want popcorn? Yes. You can just ask for popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> Can I like throw him some pieces? Yes. <laughs> and it was said, let there be popcorn. And so the popcorn <laughs> was presented. Yeah, and you... then I'm just going to get a big old scoop and just like throw it at his face. <laughs> <laughs> 
all the same. I'm pretty sure this is magic popcorn and and it's never gonna run out ever. We will test But I also this just theory. made that up. <laughs> we are prepared to test this theory. Yeah, it's not guarded or anything, so by all means it's this is actual food. Okay. He is going to after the two of you have been served, you see him forcing his head into the machine and just ah, with his tongue slathering around on the inside of it, picking up all the excess grease and stuff. Ah. John's just watching this in near abject horror, just kind of one little bit of popcorn at a time. And as he's crunching, uh, the, the sound of his bites cannot be heard over the commotion that Dargan's creating. He is going to kind of look around and just, uh, Hello. We were summoned here. Uh, just making sure this is fine. We're going to take our popcorn, leave an IOU. John finishes writing up a ticket that says IOU, John Carmichael, uh, and just sets it on the table. We're going to investigate the music now. If you uh, have anything to say about what's happening, speak now, or you just lost a lot of popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> You don't hear any objections. Very good. Down the hall into cinema theater number one. Numero. <laughs> oh, look and at look, that. You find yourselves in an enormous theater. Oh, wow. Cool. wow, that's really big. The projection, the projector is blank. You can see vague movement and like, like an old time film reel that's at the end. Yeah. And you can hear music playing over the background. And you see, sitting in the very front row, a figure with curly red hair, a fuzzy hat and a big bag of popcorn. <laughs> well, John's um, just going to start striding over <clears throat> to go sit with them. As you start walking, the image being projected changes. And now you're looking at yourselves. Yeah, I figured. It's as if the projector is a huge mirror, though it is not. And so everybody can clearly see everyone else. Paracelsus just lifts a hand and sort of waves. Uh, hello. And gestures for you to come down the aisle. John looks back. Adesena, hey, I'd like to test something while we're here. Can you? Yeah. Oh, um, yes. I mean, yes, testing. I want to find out if what we say to each other here is going to appear as subtitles on the screen or if we're entirely amongst ourselves in this place. As this is going through your heads, the subtitles are appearing on the screen. Yeah, that's about right. How did you know that was gonna happen? Because it would be cool, that's why. Oh. Okay. And John's gonna end it. Unless Asana keeps talking, in which case John's not going to end it, he's just gonna keep <laughs> hearing it. You see Paracelsus just continuing to eat piece after piece. Well, at least we know no one's in his mind. At least not right now. I always did like the front row. Bit of a <clears throat> creak of the neck, but well worth it. 
Khan stands behind Paracels is just kind of in that weird, I'm not right next to you, but I'm not directly behind you. I mean, like your are <sighs> You know, the more modern cinemas, the front gets way too close. But yeah, I think this is about a good spot right here. Uh, sir, would you like us to sit amongst you or can we just pick anywhere we'd like? Please, we have the whole place to ourselves. I'll sit down across the aisle from him, but in the same row. Dargan has detected discarded popcorn on the floor and is now <laughs> working his way through the shot. And he's, again, fairly large, right? He's, he's as big as a person. And so you can hear the, the chairs going, dong, dong, dong. I kind of imagine him like almost the size of one of those raptors from Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. A Sena, right? Yes. Very she's funny. not sitting in a seat. She's just like up in front. <laughs> <laughs> Very pleased to make your acquaintance. Um, hmm. Thanks. Well, you found this place without much trouble. I don't suppose I should have expected anything less. Yeah, was there like directions? Because I just kind of thought about it. And that we were here. That's as good as direction as any. It'd probably be hard for most people. Are you most people? I think not. Mm. So, how's your day? Um. Why'd you call us here? Because there are no secrets in the Panopticon. No hidden blades, no snipers, no traps, no misconstrued truths. And for somebody with the reputation like the two of you, I thought that might be best. Because you don't trust us. How many people have tried to kill you? None that I know of. Really? That... That is odd, given how many people you have killed. Exactly. Oh, the, that... Oh. Beside the point. The point is, I thought it would be best to meet the two of you in a place where, if I tried anything, you could see it right away, because that would probably be the least likely way for you to try to kill me. Oh, like you thought that we thought that you were going to kill us? Might have that doesn't even mind. cross my mind at all. He, I uh, get it, though. I get it. He's looking in the projection at John. <laughs> <laughs> John just looks back and shrugs. He probably thought about it because he thinks a lot. Well, with everything that's happened happened he would have to i don't know he was a little excited to be here saying that you were sorry <laughs> i thought this was a place of no secrets you're not wrong uh as my colleague has said sir uh i am beyond elated to have a chance to speak with you without coming into custody first Well, after we get finished talking, we'll see if that's still the case. Well, let me be quite frank, sir. If things don't end the way that I expect during this meeting, you're likely never going to see us again. And if you do, it won't be here and it won't be for long. Do you catch my meaning? I'll bet you a bag of popcorn you're wrong. I'll bet you a bag of popcorn you're used to being right. I thought the popcorn was free. It is. That's the best part of all this. In any case, uh, thinly veiled breads aside, sir, I am very happy to be here. And I believe this is going to take quite a while. 
I would assume since you've packed in for a movie, you wouldn't mind another story of a sort. There will be an intermission because it's going to take quite a while. That's exactly why I'm here. And speaking of intermission, Coriander Society Adventures will return momentarily. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 